China has identified the cause of the mysterious new virus. Coronavirus. Coronavirus. There are fears a rapidly spreading virus has reached Australia. This is a rapidly emerging situation. The first US case has been detected. China is urging its citizens not to travel abroad as it struggles to contain the virus. The word virus is usually associated with infections, disease and death. Viruses recently have become the number one enemy, shutting down almost our entire planet. The Prime Minister has announced the most drastic limits to our lives that the UK has ever seen in living memory. Because when they go into these homes, the woman in there, we understand, is unconscious. You must stay at home. But what if these same viruses could be re-engineered to help us fight some of our most deadly diseases? On May 22nd, the news broke that the very first patients had been injected with a breakthrough cancer-killing virus. Tests conducted on animals have already shown it to be able to reduce the size of colon, lung, breast, ovarian, and pancreatic cancer. So have we hit the holy grail? And how do these viruses only kill the cancer and not the patient? And if they do work, how long do we need to wait until cancer is a thing of the past? Let's take a deep dive into the viruses that kill cancer. Hi, I'm Dr. Ben Miles. My job is to help scientists turn these sorts of scientific breakthroughs into technologies that get into the hands of society and actually make it better. On this channel, I hope to encourage more people like you to take up this role because we have some serious problems that need solving on this planet. No pressure, but I am counting on you. Today, we're looking at how we train viruses to fight cancer. Let's start with a history lesson. At the beginning of the 20th century, scientists noticed that some patients with cancer who then contracted a viral infection showed a decrease in the size of their tumors. This surprising observation led to the development of a range of theories and ideas exploring the relationship between viruses and cancer. In the 1950s, in a series of experiments, patients with cancer were purposefully given infectious bodily fluids or infected tissue harvested from other patients with ongoing viral infections. The viruses used include hepatitis, influenza, and picornavirus. Miraculously, many of these patients showed some level of tumor remission, shrinking the size of their tumors but the remission would only last one to two months. Overall, however, the negative effect of having the accompanying illness and morbidity of having the virus and cancer overruled the potential benefit. Trials conducted between the 1950s to the 1980s showed no positive clinical outcomes as researchers struggled to control the effect of the virulence. Over time, with little impact on the results, interest faded and the idea was largely abandoned. That was until the 1990s, where genetic engineering technologies rekindled interest in oncolytic viruses. These new technologies enabled scientists to alter the viruses inserting or deleting genetic material to make them more specific to tumor cells and less dangerous to healthy cells. Fast forwarding to today, a therapeutic known as Vaccinia, developed by Imugene and specifically genetically engineered to infect, replicate in and kill cancer cells while sparing human healthy cells has just entered phase one clinical trials to test on humans. But how do these viruses actually work? I wanna talk about this in general terms because this is a class of viruses rather than just a specific virus. So there are a few different mechanisms of action that I think are interesting and worth looking at. But let's start with the basics. Viruses are biological machines that are masters of infiltrating cells. The genetic code stored within these viruses hijacks the cell's means of production and turns them into virus-producing factories, accumulating virus particles until they burst and releasing those viruses into the neighboring cells. Both natural and genetically engineered oncolytic viruses, cancer-fighting viruses, take advantage of the many genetic differences between cancer cells and normal cells. They may, for example, more effectively infect a cancer cell just because that cancer cell's viral defenses aren't working as effectively as a healthy cell. Some cancer cells may also overexpress certain receptors on the cell's surface that may further help the viruses to bind to and infect malignant cells. Basically, researchers are looking for opportunities that give viruses a genetic or a reproductive advantage if and only if they target cancer cells rather than healthy cells. In a modified adenovirus, Onyx015, researchers found that it can only reproduce in cells that are missing a particular gene that produces a protein known as P53, a tumor suppressor. The unmodified virus normally replicates in human cells thanks to a viral gene it contains that inactivates P53. 
When this gene is removed from the virus, it can then only replicate in cells where the P53 gene is defective. Typically, these are cancer cells. And so you have a virus that can only reproduce and damage cancer cells. Some oncolytic viruses can also insert genes into the cell that cause it to produce proteins that metabolize a separately administered, otherwise non-toxic or inactive drug into a cytotoxin or an active drug component. In effect, making a compound toxic only in cells that have become infected with a virus. To help track these tumors within the body, some viruses have also been engineered to encode transmembrane proteins responsible for the uptake of iodine. This means that radioactive iodine can be actively transported into the infected cancer cell, helping both localized radiotherapies as well as tumor imaging. The virus under trial, Vaccinia, is based on the active viral constituents of the vaccine that eradicated smallpox. So this is a virus that has proved to be safe and trialed already on millions of people, which is why we no longer, fingers crossed, have smallpox. Vaccinia has a few different mechanisms of action that it draws from. One of them is that it injects cancer cells with the human sodium iodide symporter which is a gene that enables imaging to track the virus in vivo and make accompanying targeted radiotherapy more accurate. Vaccinia can also be armed with an anti-PDL1 gene, which disables PDL1, which is a cellular signaling pathway that helps cells tell the immune system not to attack them. With these signals removed, that means that the body's immune system can actively start to target and attack the cancer cells. The tests conducted on animals have already shown it to be able to reduce the size of colon, lung, breast, ovarian, and pancreatic cancer tumors. And as of April, Vaccinia just entered into phase one clinical trials, which aim to recruit about 100 cancer patients with metastatic or advanced solid tumors across the US and Australia. So I guess the big question is how long do we actually have to wait? This is what the pathway looks like typically to get new medicine into the marketplace. The team has already conducted non-clinical animal testing to show the efficacy of this technology, and it's just entered into phase one clinical trials. Phase one clinical trials typically last six to 18 months and look at the side effects of the therapy, the dosing required, and how the drug actually works within the body. Phase two trials are conducted on larger population sizes and try to refine the dosing process and effects on a wider population before finally phase three trials are on a very large population and look to understand if there are any subpopulations that the therapy isn't effective on, like those that might have a compromised immune system or some other genetic traits. That whole process can last typically five to 10 years, depending on how complicated the studies are to conduct and the availability of clinical trial test subjects, which actually is one of the most common reasons that clinical trials actually fail because they can't find enough patients to test on. Within the context of this technology, there are definitely some problems still to overcome. If the immune system becomes activated soon after the virus has infected the cells, then the viruses can actually be cleared from the bloodstream quickly before the cancer fighting effects are actually realized. Another problem is that pre-existing immunity is also quite common. Most of the population gets vaccinated against viruses or encounters them over the course of their life, resulting in immune memory. This might mean that we need a different viral vector for every single therapy so that we don't become immune to our own medicines. So how far away actually are we? Well, maybe as little as five to 10 years, which might seem like a very long time, but compared to the span of human history, it's only the blink of an eye. Now, the reality check here is that 90% of new therapies fail to make it through clinical trials but all of our eggs aren't in one basket. Oncolytic viruses are a tool set that we are only just learning to control. And I can't see a future where they don't have some clinical value in tackling diseases, whether it's cancer or whether it's something else. I spoke recently with CEO Dr. Joe Healy of NanoSyrinx, whose company is using viruses to inject medicines that are hard for the body to otherwise absorb directly into cells in order to improve their efficacy. I'll leave a link to the podcast and my discussion with him down below if you're interested. I think this is doing something really interesting for the field of biology also. Really, I think there are huge opportunities here that will define the next few decades of our existence on this planet. So if you are young and aspiring in these fields, then absolutely get involved. If you enjoyed this video, do consider leaving a like or a comment down below. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.